Sorry, everybody. This is Kristen Steimanoff, unmuted at Health Outreach Partners. Um, and this is the third session of the SDOH Academy's Learning Collaborative on Addressing Social Determinants of Health in Rural Areas. Um, we are being joined by our colleagues at Migrant Clinicians Network, at the National LGBT Health Education Center, and at Capital Link. And there will be three additional learning collaboratives between January and June presented by other national cooperative agreements who are a part of the SDOH Academy. So stay tuned for those. Next slide, please. I'm going to spend just a minute or two giving you an overview of where we are and where we're going and then turn it over to our presenters for today. But as a reminder, we're in our third session today. So on November 6th, Christina and I kicked things off with a session that focused on key issues and health risk factors facing rural communities. And we also talked about identifying and prioritizing unmet needs and outreach strategies and connecting people to care in rural communities. Then on November 13th, Alex Karoglian from the National LGBT Health Education Center and Theresha Lyons from Migrant Clinicians Network talked about understanding trauma to meet the social determinants of health needs of rural populations. And Alex and Theresha provided really good, important information about screening for trauma, about providing trauma-informed care and coordinating care even in mobile populations. We took a break last week for Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a lovely break. And today we are very excited to have Jillian Hopewell from Migrant Clinicians Network and Alex Karoglian from the National LGBT Health Education Center. They're going to discuss challenges and opportunities for collecting and using SDOH data in rural health centers. Our final session is going to be next Tuesday at the same time, and our colleagues at Capital Link are going to be joined by a health center representative, and they're going to talk about financing infrastructure development in rural communities. So we hope you'll join us for that too. Next slide. I see a lot of familiar names, so hopefully you're all comfortable with this by now, but as we have the first two times, we're gonna be using GoToWebinar. Um, if you're experiencing technical issues and you can't contact one of us, you can call them at 1-800-263-6317. But we also have Christina and Liam standing by in our office. So if you need tech support and you can get through to one of them in the chat, um, they can help you out. Um, as we have done the first two times, you'll be in listen-only mode throughout the content part of this presentation. We're going to finish the formal content presentation no later than the top of the hour, and then we're going to open it up for chat. So you can use the hand raise feature. You can use the question box feature. Um, we're actually going to ask you to type into the question box feature in a second to introduce yourselves, but we can facilitate a virtual conversation that way. And it's been going really well, so we hope you'll take advantage of that and um, give us a chance to, to hear from you. So before we get going on the content, let's do that. Let's find out who's in this virtual room with us. If you will please do us the favor of writing in that question box your organization name and your name, and I will introduce who's in the room and then we'll get started. always takes a second to have people start typing but again if you can type your organization name and just your first name is fine in the question box we will introduce you oh good there we go all right, so we have Terry Kennedy from the Kansas PCA, Debbie Rivera and Clarissa Garcia from Mora Valley Community Health Services, Donna Reeves from Central County's Health Centers in Springfield, Illinois, Margaret from Cabarrus Rowan Community Health Centers, Kelly Carrie Lindsay and Teresa from Southwest Montana Community Health Center, Shelby from Molokai Community Health Center, aloha, thanks Shelby, 
Um, Angie Roan from Cass County Health Clinic. Shelly Hardin with Healthcare Collaborative of Rural Missouri Live Well Clinics. Whitney Allen from the Kentucky Primary Care Association. Eileen Tremaine from Mountain Valley's Health Centers, CA299 Health Collaborative. Mackenzie Houston from the Tennessee Primary Care Association. Jesus Blanco from the Idaho Primary Care Association. Angela Castro from Variety Care in Oklahoma. Hiwat from Cabarrus Rowan Community Health Centers. Tiffany from Isabella Citizens for Health in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Rob Funk and Terry Friend from Mountain Laurel Medical Center. Wonderful, welcome to you all. And thanks for letting us know when you have more than one person on the line with you. Um, if anybody else pops in, we'll try to introduce them if there's a free moment. But without further ado, Jillian, I will turn it over to you to get us started on today's session. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks very much. Um, so my name is Jillian Hopewell. I'm the Director of Education and Communication for the Migrant Clinicians Network. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Alex Karogian, who's the Director of Education and Training Programs at the Fenway Institute, which is also the National LG LGBTQ uh, National Education Center. So we're going to be talking um, today about uh, rural health center data sources. Um, and in particular, we'll be talking some about the collection of data, but, but a lot of what we'll be focusing on is the effective use of SDOH um, data once it is, you know, once it's been gathered by health centers and some strategies that, that different health centers have used. So we're gonna do a brief review um, of some of the data sources that were discussed in session one, because um, Kristen and Christina did a, did a nice overview of data at that point. Um, and then we're gonna do some a deeper dive into looking at some specific sources of SDOH um, data, including PREPARE and the SOGI data, uh, and then um, look at some other case studies of where people have used data in rural health centers to great um, success. Uh, and then we'll look forward to opening it up to discussion. So this is just, um, this, this um, graphic here is actually the data that you gave to us when you initially registered for this uh, learning collaborative. And the question, one of the questions that we asked you was, how do you identify unmet need in the communities that you serve? And so these were your responses here. Um, and, you know, interestingly and, and really not surprisingly, the largest um, source of data for you are your patient intake forms. And that's something that we're really going to be talking about today, looking at, uh, you know, how can you, how do you ask effective questions in health centers to get the data that you need? Um, this is our, where I'm going to review some of the, of what was discussed um, in session one. And I definitely, you know, if you have some questions that were left over from session one, I really encourage that to be part of our conversation um, during the discussion section, which I hope that you're all able to stay on the line for. But um, Kristen and Christina talked about the UDS uh, data mapper, which has a lot of really rich data that you can, um, that can get you really good information, particularly as you're doing some of your needs assessments in, in, um, in the communities that you serve. And looking at, in addition to the UDS data mapper, looking at the HRSA data warehouse, which, you know, can get you to your medically underserved areas, um, some of your uh, health profession needs, and a whole, variety of, a whole variety of other things. And I'm hoping, you know, one of the questions we wanted to have was, you know, since that last, since the first session, have you had a chance to go to the UDS data mapper and explore your options? Um, both, actually, for the the question is about the the mapper, but the data sources in general. Um, did that pique your interest, and were you able to get over and and take a look at that? And um, Christina, I believe you had the poll open just to let us know, and we'll give you guys a couple minutes, or not a couple minutes, thirty seconds or so to answer that question. Well, Christina, I think I, you're, 
I don't think I have control over the poll, so just let me know when you. So I'm operating a little bit in the dark. I can't see it here because I'm sharing my screen. So Christina, I don't know if you can unmute and let me know what people said. Oh, certainly. Okay, so 16% of you said yes, you've had the chance to use the UDS mapper, another tool, and 84% of you said no. Okay, so we have some work to do. <laughs> so let's maybe perhaps in our discussion section, we'll, we'll sort of do a bookmark on that and um, we can talk about um, whether you think this is going to be an effective tool for you moving forward or, or not, and perhaps why why you haven't been able to access it or just haven't done it yet. So we'll, we'll have a chance to talk about some of that. But what we're really focusing on today is more of this, this kind of big picture uh, sources of data. So looking at collecting social determinant of health data, um, using what you have or ways that you can modify your systems to collect data and um, use them. Um, that's really that, you know, 64% of you talked about that's the main source of data that you use. And so we're going to really be focusing in on some of those things today. Um, and I know we're not really going to address today this issue of patient surveys and focus groups. I know that there were some questions that came out of um, session one. And so this would be another good area for us to have some discussion. Um, and if there are any sort of additional questions or thoughts about patient surveys and focus groups. There's a lot to cover. We could really do a whole learning collaborative just on the data on and collection and use of data. So unfortunately, we're not getting to everything today, but hopefully we're going to be getting to some really useful things for you. So um, we're going to do a deeper dive into um, some of this data collection piece. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize, um, and I know it's you know, it's a it's a common sort of discussion point just in general in our lives these days. But there's opportunities to collect data everywhere and there is tons of data collected. But what we do with that data is really the, you know, that's really where kind of the rubber meets the road. And in are we collecting data just for the sake of collecting data or are we really doing something useful with with it? So I want to sort of emphasize that throughout and I know that Alex is also going to be talking about how data gets used in the health center to really make some effective changes. Some of you may be familiar with PREPARE, and I want to say in advance that um, the slides where we're talking about PREPARE, um, the slides themselves, I um, these come from a presentation that was put together by the group of organizations that are responsible for PREPARE. Um, which are uh, NAC, National Association of Community Health Centers, the Oregon um, PCA, and then our colleagues at APSHO, the Asian Pacific Islander Health Organization. Um, and so for those of you who are not familiar with PREPARE, I, I have a feeling that most of you have probably heard these, um, heard this term at least um, tossed around, but they're, what they're really looking to do is to develop this standardized protocol. And we'll talk about this throughout here, when they're talking about a standardized protocol, they're, they're not talking about making a um, making it sort of the same throughout. I mean, it's really very um, modifiable, but, but looking at sort of standardizing the protocol for beginning to address social determinants of health and gathering that data and then looking at what to do with it. So very practically what they're doing is they, they have um, certain core measures that they are, um, uh, core measures that, they, that they're looking at and they're some of the things that are already being captured in people's EHR. So they're looking at race and education, ethnicity, employment, um, insurance status, um, veteran status, income, language, housing, transportation, a number of sort of, and sort of going down the list of, of things that they're, they're addressing. And then they've got a number of optional measures um, that relate to safety and exposure to violence and incarceration and a number of other things. So what they're really doing is look, they're working with uh, within the EHR to see about modifying it so that they, it can, they can begin to uh, um, collect this data 
developing the workflows and the staffing models to make that possible um, and making that something that is can be modified according to the need and the structure of different sites. Um, interestingly, the, the prepare, and we'll go into this a little bit more, but is they're really looking at individual patient level action as well as looking at population health. And that's a really critical thing when you're looking at SDOH, um, really effective use of data. Um, and then some of the other things that I've already discussed here. Um, so this is just, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I want you, it, if you haven't seen this, I think it's really helpful. And it really points to the idea of this, of, you know, trying to, to implement something like prepare to, a, to um, capture and use social determinant of health data um, in ways that can be flexible enough to, to suit different settings. So these are examples of five different community health centers that have incorporated, they've been, they're part of their pilot sites and they have incorporated prepare into their, um, into their workflows. And so you can see, as you look through this, there's different, there's many different ways and um, different models of how it's been done. It can be done by nursing staff, it can be done by non-clinical staff um, and at different points. Um, so, you know, is it in the waiting room or in the exam room? Uh, it, the, this whole notion of a no wrong door approach. So I think it's, it's um, interesting and helpful, I think, to see the different ways in which uh, PREPARE has been used in different sites. And it, it really does sort of require um, the sites and staff at sites to um, try and figure out what's going to work out best for them. Uh, this, uh, this, was the, this is the data that's come out of the pilot project. And so um, it's a total of seven community health centers in um, four different states. But if you, can, if you look at their initial data, they're, they're finding that most patients are presenting with somewhere between four and seven social determinant of health risk factors. And then this gets to the, the, what we touched on at the beginning was looking at patient level versus population level and then system and policy level. So this is how the data and also getting to this whole notion of you know, effectively using data. So the, within the pilot sites that have been using PREPARE, they were, they've been using that data to build and expand on existing services and figuring out how they can meet patient needs um, and pe meet patients where they are at the health center themselves. At the population level, looking at, you know, how do, how do they then take it? And um, I know there's some PCAs on the line, um, but, you know, working with PCAs and other state level organizations or, you know, regional organizations to try and address some of these needs. And then ideally, ultimately, if we really get good information about what social determinants of health um, patients are confronting, we can really look at health delivery redesign and system and policy level changes. The NAC and the rest and, and APCHO and Oregon PCA and the other groups that have been involved in, in the PREPARE project are working with um, within some of the EHR templates for the major companies that are doing EHRs for health centers. The, it's currently available, as it says here at NextGen, eClinical, uh, GE Centricity, and Epic, which is about 60% of all health centers. And then they're in development with the other um, companies that are listed here, which then would represent somewhere between 85 and 95% of all health centers. And you can find out more information about it um, at the website that's there that, on the NAC website. So I um, had an interesting conversation um, with uh, the staff over at APCHO who've been really instrumental um, in developing PREPARE and, and in this whole rollout of the of pilot sites. And so we had um, a good conversation about what they see as the lessons um, from PREPARE for rural health centers in particular. And so I just wanted to highlight a few things that they, that they talked about um, that have happened with health centers 
um, or where, where they see opportunities for rural health centers. So one of the things they mentioned was that um, they have had health centers um, implement, prepare health centers that have both rural and urban sites, and that it's been a really um, good way for them to kind of equalize some of the resources. And so even if a community, if a rural health center doesn't have access to needed patient services within their rural area, um, that the urban sites have been able to send resources over to the to the urban, I mean to the rural site. Sorry. So there was a they cited an example of um, uh, they had a food pantry service in an urban site, and they were able to um, modify that and make it a mobile food pantry service, so that food could then get delivered to the rural site as well, um, and then. With mobile vans, they have effectively used mobile vans to go and implement the prepare survey to um, to sort of larger groups of people. So, for instance, if you had um, an ag an agricultural worker camp in a certain area, then you could take a mobile van with staff that were trained in administering the prepare survey and get a better idea of some of the social determinants of health or documentation. I think we have a very good idea lots of times, but documentation of it. Um, interestingly, they talked about geomapping uh, from prepare patient zip codes in rural areas to figure out um, if there could be a way to modify bus routes that would be more successful in getting patients to, to appointments. Um, and that some rural health centers have used the data to advocate for better bus routes within with their local transportation authority. Um, they also talked about, and again, I know we've got some PCAs on the line, but that uh, if rural health centers are able to really document the social determinants of health that they're seeing, that they may be able to better advocate for themselves at the state level with the PCA, but also with state policymakers. Um, and that it really is an opportunity to marry the, the work with the ongoing efforts of, of PCAs. So those were the main um, things that they felt were really effective for uh, were sort of some, some over, overarching thoughts for rural health centers with PREPARE. So now um, I'm wondering if any of you, it's another yes, no um, poll question, but if any of you had experience using the PREPARE workflows at this point, and the poll, Christina's going to open the poll, and then Christina, I'll need you to share. The poll is up, Jillian. Thank you, Kristen. Got 80% having voted. Almost there. 84%. Quick, quick vote. <laughs> what if we could get 100%? That'd be amazing. <laughs> All right, we can close it. We're at 87%. That's pretty good. Oops. Uh -oh. We have 7% yes and 93% no. Okay. Interesting. Um, and that sort of mirrors my, my experience um, going to different health centers. I think there's some different challenges. And so I'm curious to know if you have not known it, why? Um, I was limited to five options to give you, but you can check um, when that poll gets opened up, you can check all of the um, all of the answers that apply to you. And there there wasn't an option for me to give you an other. So there may be something else that's not listed. It's open now. And if you have another reason, feel free to type it into the question box and we can read that off. Good point. This is a harder one to answer. We have 42% people having voted so far. Give it a couple more seconds. I see something in the question box. Okay, we're getting a couple there. So after we close the poll, we'll read off those too. 
And I'll just say as we're as we're sort of getting set to close um, and and look at the results. Um, one of the things we will do, I didn't we didn't send you homework in advance just because we felt like with Thanksgiving last week it was going to be hard for people to get work done. But um, we will send out some resources. And so if, if anyone is interested in learning more about prepare, there's a lot of information out there. So okay. What are folks saying, Kristen? So we've got almost 60% of people saying they haven't been trained. 59% said that. 41% um, don't have enough information. Okay. And then 9% said it's too cumbersome. 9% mm -hmm. said we don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. And 5% said we don't have staff acceptance. That's on the poll. And then um, one of our participants said that they've just started training on prepare. Oh, great. One okay. Says they've done a pilot screening, but not with the prepare tool. And one said they're in a PCA, but some of their members are using it. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I think that that, um, I think what you are saying is reflective of a lot of what's, what I see out um, across the country. And so, I think there's a lot of potential with prepare um, and I do think there are some ongoing challenges in terms of um, real, getting people to have the time space and um, wherewithal to to embrace it so I think that it's a good conversation to have going forward and I would encourage you if you don't know much about it I would encourage you to find out more about it and because I think there's a lot of really as we talked about some flexible ways that you can begin to implement it but it's also not the only thing out there um, and you know one of the things that and we're going to go and shift over to um, Alex's discussion now but I think what Alex will talk about is is really critical and it's some of the things that we're going to talk about in some of the case studies too as if we have time at the end um, is the idea that you you can't I think one of the things that that when you start using a data, um, start gathering and analyzing data from a real broad brush like Prepare, is it can get very overwhelming. And you're, you know, we all know we work with patient populations that have many needs. And so, how do you begin to focus that, and how do you drill down? Because we can't do, we can't focus on everything at the same time. So um, Alex is going to talk to us about um, uh, taking a deeper dive into um, the sexual orientation and gender identity uh, data. And I think that there's some really interesting and um, instructive things that will come out of this. So Alex. Hi, everybody. This is Alex Groglian. I'm a psychiatrist at Fenway Health, a health center in Boston. And direct the National LGBT Health Education Center. We're gonna focus for a few minutes on sexual orientation and gender identity data collection as a way to address social determinants of health at rural health centers. And SOGI really um, is a form of uh, social determinants of health, both of these factors as we'll see. Next slide. Great, thank you. We talk about LGBTQ people and use that acronym often, and it sometimes seems like that's one homogenous population where everybody has the same experiences and the same health needs. The reality is each of these subpopulations separated by commas here, the L, the G, the B, the T, and the Q, have unique health experiences and unique health needs. So let's briefly walk through concepts and terminology so that we can talk about the data collection piece. Next slide, please. There are a lot of terms that get used when we start focusing on care for LGBTQ people that are overwhelming and confusing. So we'll try to break it down now. Next slide. The first big point to make is that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same thing. These are two different concepts, two different experiences that people have. Everyone has both a sexual orientation and a gender identity. So all of us on this webinar today have one of each. The terms people have used throughout history evolved. So the terms people used 20 years ago are different than the terms used 10 years ago, five years ago, even 
a year ago. I'm hearing new terms from my patients in the last four to six months I hadn't heard previously. And the terms a given person uses will also vary throughout their lifetime. So someone may initially identify as straight, later identify as gay. Someone may initially identify as a man and later identify as a woman. That's one of the reasons why it's important to collect these data with some regularity, not just check the box and assume that it's done. So we recommend doing so at least on an annual basis. Next slide, please. Gender identity is a person's inner sense of being girl, woman, a boy, man, of another gender or of no gender. When babies are born in most countries and cultures around the world, they're assigned one of two sexes based on external anatomy, female or male. And we now appreciate that those babies grow up, become children, adolescents, and adults who may have gender identity, an inner sense of their gender that doesn't line up in a conventional sense with the sex they were assigned when they were born. And we also appreciate that people have more than two possible gender identities. It's not just girl or boy, uh, woman or man. So increasingly, we focus on folks who have non-binary gender identities, who are uh, identifying this way in healthcare and in life, and uh, we need systems that are responsive to that. Gender expression is how a person communicates or presents their gender to the outside world. It can be through mannerisms, the way someone walks, their voice, their hairstyle, the way they dress. Gender expression also exists as a continuum. People express their gender in many ways, and you can't necessarily predict someone's gender identity based on their gender expression. Next slide, please. What's the T in LGBTQ? It stands for transgender. This is an umbrella term for folks who have a gender identity that doesn't align conventionally with the sex they were assigned when they were born. If someone is assigned female, male sex at birth and identifies as a woman, they may refer to themselves as a transgender woman, a trans woman, simply as a woman. And we see terms in the biomedical literature like male to female or MTF. If someone was assigned female sex at birth and identifies as a man, they may refer to themselves as a transgender man, trans man. We see terms like female to male or FTM in the literature as well. And non-binary people, in many ways, they may identify. The most common terms we hear are gender queer and uh, gender fluid. There are many others as well. Gender fluid has a bit more of an implication of a gender identity that's dynamic and going to evolve over time. Increasingly, we use terms like transmasculine and transfeminine that are inclusive of people with non-binary gender identities. So transmasculine person is assigned female sex at birth, identifies as more masculine than feminine, whether they identify in a binary way as a man or not. Next slide, please. That's gender identity. Sexual orientation is how a person identifies their physical, emotional, and romantic attractions to other people. So there are three components to this. One is attraction. This is whom someone is attracted to. We ask, who are you attracted to? Or what are the genders of the people you're attracted to? Behavior refers to whom someone is or isn't engaging in sexual activity with and what kind of sexual activity. And then identity refers to the range of labels and communities that exist in society that a person may identify with regarding their sexual orientation, like straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and queer, for example. A key point here, which is central to SOGI data collection, is one of self-identification. We can't assume we know how someone identifies their sexual orientation based on their sexual behavior. For example, there are many men who have sex with men who don't identify as gay, don't identify as bisexual, don't identify as queer, identify as straight. So we have to let people self-identify. Next slide, please. Why are sexual orientation and gender identity social determinants of health? There are many health disparities experienced uniquely or disproportionately by LGBTQ people, sexual and gender minority people, compared to the general population. This starts young in early childhood and adolescence, including much higher prevalence of depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, suicidal ideation and attempts and suicide completion than non-LGBTQ peers. In early and middle adulthood, much higher prevalence of various cancers, for example, and uh, again, of various mental health problems. And in older adulthood, we hear a lot of heartbreaking stories about 
mistreatment in assisted living facilities and uh, services for older adults, LGBTQ people in the context of all this minority stress, sexual minority stress and gender minority stress will avoid seeking needed urgent or preventative health care, decreased engagement in primary care, decreased self-care, and down the road a much higher prevalence of physical health problems as well, like a higher prevalence of diabetes, for example, among sexual and gender minority women. So a key component here is to end invisibility of LGBTQ people in healthcare, and that means collecting data on sexual orientation and gender identity so we know who our LGBTQ patients are and can tailor health services accordingly in a patient-centered way. Whenever I give a talk like this, I ask how many people in the room have ever been asked by a clinician for their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And I've never had half the room or more raise their hands, which goes to show that's urban, that's rural, it's anywhere. Um, goes to show that as clinicians, admittedly, we don't do a good job of this. This is one example of why it's important to collect these data. Jake is a 45-year-old man, came in with pain and on x-ray what appeared to be metastases from an unknown primary cancer. Turns out Jake is a trans man who had chest construction surgery, didn't feel comfortable disclosing his transgender status because this health center didn't ask for sexual orientation or gender identity in an affirming way. So he unfortunately didn't get screening for breast cancer, even though his mother and sister also had a history of breast cancer, and this cancer wasn't caught until it was too late. This is one of the tools on our website for SOGI data collection. It's our Ready, Set, Go toolkit. This is approved by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare and disseminated uh, nationally. This works with any electronic health record system you may have. We work with Epic, NextGen, Centricity, eClinical Works, all of them, and they're all, in, to varying degrees and in various ways, incorporating features and functionalities so there can be clinical decision support for care teams based on SOGI data. People know to do, for example, preventative cancer screening based on the organs in someone's body, not uh, based on the sex listed in their chart. These two in green are tools for staff to know how to collect SOGI information, very concrete instructions for how to ask these questions, both in English and in Spanish. All these resources, by the way, are available for free download as PDFs from our website, lgbthealtheducation.org, all these toolkits. Next slide, please. And these are pamphlets for patients who may have questions or concerns potentially about why you're asking for their sexual orientation or gender identity. As I think most of you know, the Bureau of Primary Healthcare has mandated that all centers, all health centers report these data in the UDS since 2016, acknowledging that um, there really are adverse health outcomes related to these social determinants of health, and we need to know this information about all our patients, not just LGBTQ patients. Do patients object to this? There are a couple of studies here uh, indicating otherwise for the most part. Even though 80% of clinicians believe clients would refuse to provide sexual orientation, only 10% of patients said they would refuse to provide this information in healthcare, and that number is even lower if the questions are asked in a sensitive, effective way. Another study in uh, Minnesota had a demographic form, two versions, one with SOGI questions, one without. Patients were no more likely to be offended by the forms with SOGI questions, and the percentage of patients offended by either form was only 3%. So it's a lot of anticipatory anxiety on the part of staff who feel not equipped to ask, you know, to ask these questions in a sensitive, effective way. This is how we ask about sexual orientation at Fenway Health. You can see it's in demographic information at registration, along with information about race, marital status, ethnicity, income, for example. Next slide. This is how we ask about gender identity. Important for this to be a two-step process, current gender identity and sex assigned at birth. Otherwise, if you don't have sex assigned at birth and just have current gender identity, a lot of transgender people will check male or female and the system will pick up on the fact that this is a gender diverse person. Also important to ask for all clients at registration what name they use, what the name on their insurance is, because that may be different from the name they go by, and what their pronouns are. You can also explain what pronouns are. Some people's pronouns are she, her, hers. Some people's pronouns are he, him, his. Some people's pronouns are they, them, theirs. What are your pronouns? Next slide. Increasingly, people are using non-binary pronouns like they, them, theirs in the singular. That just takes practice and training on the part of your staff. Uh, to know how to use that in the singular. You'll make mistakes at the beginning. That's okay. It's about apologizing and moving on to ensure this data collection occurs. 
uh, there are other pronouns emerging as well for non-binary people like Z here. So you can have the best data collection electronic system. If your staff aren't trained to engage clients in a sensitive, effective way to collect these data, then the system will fall flat. Next slide, please. Important for staff to know to ask uh, if they're not sure. I'd like to be respectful. What are your name and pronouns? The name the patient gives doesn't match your insurance, so just ask in a non-judgmental, supportive way. Could your charter insurance be under a different name? What's the name on your insurance? If you ask, accidentally use the wrong term or pronoun, just apologize and move on. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be disrespectful. How do you like me to refer to you, for example? These are data we looked at from the UDS nationally and found that rural health centers, contrary to our hypothesis, were more likely to report uh, sexual orientation data than urban health centers. And this has a lot to do with the kind of intimacy and knowing each other in, in rural settings. However, rural health centers were less likely to report something other than chose not to disclose. They're more likely to say chose not to disclose than urban health centers. So they're not necessarily getting um, LGBTQ statuses to the same extent that rural health centers are. So there's some work there, I think, around not just checking something, but actually asking the questions in a way that's going to yield a valid response. Next slide. Same thing with gender identity data. Rural health centers are more likely to report gender identity than urban health centers. These are the 2016 data. Um, that said, they're also more likely to report chose not to disclose. So some work to do in rural health centers to ask these questions in a sensitive, effective way, maybe to unpack some of the implicit bias that the staff at the health centers have when collecting these data. Next slide. These are data looking at small versus large health centers. Similarly, small health centers were more likely to collect sexual orientation data. Uh, that said, they were more likely to report chose not to disclose as well. So some work to happen in smaller health centers where people maybe know each other, are more likely to ask it, but less likely to get a valid response. That may be because people are, don't want to disclose to people they know in the community, for example, that may be an issue. And next slide, please. Uh, on this one, we see similarly more likely to uh, report gender identity data at small health centers. Uh, in this case, uh, also more likely to report it chose not to disclose. Next slide, please. So some opportunities to monitor and use these data and uh, report these within your health center. Developing summary dashboards for SOGI data, um, reports that you look at monthly, incorporating these into existing reports or work groups. So not in creating parallel processes, which won't have good uptake or sustainability. So incorporating it into your existing UDS initiatives, existing initiatives for diabetes and hypertension, for example, for intimate partner violence, and certainly for social determinants of health. And giving presentations to senior management and all staff so that there's buy-in in this data collection process. Next slide, please. This is just showing that you can stratify UDS measures based on SOGI information. To look at how you're doing, for example, in various areas with UDS measures that are, um, you know, where the, there's funding attached to, where these conditions are disproportionately experienced by LGBTQ patients, like HIV testing, mammograms, preventive cancer screening occurs less often for LGBTQ patients, screening for substance use, cervical cancer screening, tobacco use, and um, screening for clinical depression, all of which are particularly uh, prevalent in this population. Next slide, please. You can also stratify and look at things like how you're doing collecting these data for clients born in the U.S. versus born outside the U.S., given that there's a large population of, um, for example, undocumented uh, migrant workers at rural health centers. So if you just look at the raw data, you'll see collected on 45 U.S. born and sorry, 40 U.S. born and 45 born outside the U.S., but if you look at this as a percentage proportionally, you see that it's being collected on uh, or missing on 7% of U.S. born and missing on 43% of those born outside the U.S. So maybe with your non-English speaking populations, the translation is not being done effectively or not being done with concepts that are culturally congruent. So that could be the kind of report you generate. Next slide. Next slide, please. Great. You can also look at, for example, uh, racial and ethnic disparities, looking at HIV testing, uh, Hispanic, Latino, and Latinx uh, gain bisexual men 
have the most rapidly increasing incidence of HIV in the United States. So thinking in rural settings about this, for example, with migrant workers, you can look at how you're doing with HIV testing based on sexual orientation and identify disparities and conduct population health management initiatives that way. Next slide, please. In terms of ongoing monitoring and quality improvement, you want to have continual processes that work for system glitches. Are all staff, for example, using the correct registration forms? You may find that there's an issue in at one particular desk where they have old forms or someone needs more training, for example. Uh, system issues may be external to the process in some situations. You want to run regular reports to identify these glitches, look for trends over time. Is there a sudden drop or a sudden spike in a particular subset of your health center and why is that occurring? Develop standard operating procedures related to these data and their collection. Uh, include this in other quality reports and initiatives like patient-centered medical home or meaningful use initiatives uh, that monitor demographics. You want to try and incorporate it into things that already have momentum in the health center. And have ongoing training for staff related to this, thinking about staff turnover and onboarding, incorporating into new staff orientation and into annual training as a refresher for your staff. Great, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Jillian. Thanks, Alex. That was great. Um, and I'm sure um, hopefully you guys have some questions um, based on what Alex talked about, and we can talk about that during the discussion time. Um, I think there's a lot of themes that run throughout um, what we have discussed as we look at sort of kind of this deeper dive into some of these other these issues. Um, and many of the lessons that Alex talked about using the SOGI data really translate to other areas as well. Um, things like the need to really incorporate uh, social determinant of health data collection into the EHR. Um, we find consistently across the board, kind of no matter what the issue is, is you know, if, for, if it's not included in the EHR, it really just doesn't get um, adapted um, or adopted by the by the health center. Um, so that's that's a really critical piece. And then this sort of ongoing quality improvement and the use of the data the, was really powerful. Um, the different examples that Alex showed of how the data can be um, how you can tease out all these different issues. So um, really important stuff. Um, I wanted to pull out uh, just a few case studies of different types of um, social determinant of health data and how it has been used. So the first one we're going to look at is transportation, and I'm going to turn that one back over to Kristen from HOP, um, because HOP has done some really great work in the realm of transportation. Great. Yeah, this is sort of short and sweet as a case study, but we have done a lot of work around transportation and we have visited a lot of health centers across the country to try to learn what they do to address it because every time we ask people what the top barriers to care for their patient populations might be, transportation always shows up at least in the top three. So what we've learned over the last many years is that there are a lot of strategies for addressing transportation barriers, not all of which include providing transportation directly but many health centers do have vans that they transport patients to and from appointments in, um, community health workers taking them in individual cars, some offer shuttle services, some have mobile units at community sites to reduce transportation as a barrier, and others will provide things like bus tokens, taxi vouchers, even mileage reimbursement if the primary barrier is the cost of transportation. Um, but one thing that I wanted to share with you, we worked several years back with a health center that wanted to do a really in-depth, comprehensive community health needs assessment. And they wanted to learn directly from their patients. What are your biggest challenges? What are your biggest needs? What are your biggest desires from your health center? And we learned from the needs assessment that transportation was a huge need. And they had heard that before and, and they, hadn't wanted to address it when they heard it before because as a lot of health centers experience, um, 
there's fear about cost. There's fear about liability, just the logistics of, of setting up a transportation program. So they sort of resisted that for a while, but ultimately decided, you know, we really do need to address this. Let's, let's study it a little, little more deeply. And they were able to launch this fantastic partnership program with their local community services board. So this local community services board already maintains a fleet of vans that they use to transport Medicaid patients. And what the health center does is they pay their community services board the same rate as Medicaid pays them. And then they offer that transportation service to all of their patients who might need it on a sliding scale. So this turned out to be a really innovative way of addressing this problem that they had heard about over and over without having to take on the responsibility themselves of buying new vehicles and, and establishing new liability policies and having all the worry that went along with that. And so I did just want to provide you all a really wonderful concrete example of how one organization decided to address that barrier for their population. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and I wanted to talk about um, a couple different health centers that um, have worked to really incorporate um, discussions of occupation as well as mobility um, into their um, into their systems. And those were identified sort of it's a it's kind of a two step process identified through needs assessments that um, that a number of uh, patients were in high risk occupations, but um, the health center was not collecting that data on an individual patient level. And so when patients were coming in, they weren't the the clinician that was seeing them was not taking into account or not taking into account their occupation and the potential that occupational exposure was causing some of the problems that they were being seen for and then also not being able to engage in some of the preventive work. So this one in particular is um, Hospital Castaner in, in Puerto Rico and um, they began, a, and this is again an example of really focusing in on one social determinant of health. So they were really looking at, at occupation as a social determinant of health and um, developed a whole system um, around the notion of occupation. And so it included um, changing their EHR so that their health center, um, and their, there's a, a resource actually that MCN developed actually a number of years ago now, but it was in collaboration with it was occupational, uh, occupational health specialists together with primary care specialists looking at if you're gonna look at um, exposure uh, environment on occupational exposure, what are the top three questions that you would want to incorporate into your EHR or into your patient intake system? So in the case of um, Castañar, they, um, they really just focused on the occupation one. And just focusing on that one social determinant of health was a very powerful thing. And it allowed them, so it allowed, and it was accompanied by a lot of training for their staff. But once a patient was identified, then um, they had they trained their clinical staff and their non-clinical staff on um, some of the risk factors that were associated with high-risk occupations in their area, um, including exposure to certain pesticides and things like that. And so they their index they raised their index of suspicion for diagnoses on the clinical side, and then on the non-clinical side, it really provided opportunities then for additional patient education and ways of looking at um, even things like how does, so if you're a farm worker with diabetes, how do you um, how do you manage your diabetes within the context of the work that you have to do and the, the challenges that you're faced with? And so it provided, it just sort of was a steamrolled and provide a number of different opportunities. Um, and then it also really allowed when when that, because disaster has really struck the island on a, in a couple major ways in the past uh, year and a half, two years. And so having a better understanding of, of occupation then also um, uh, allowed for more effective emergency uh, preparation and response protocols so that you could, and, and a better understanding of where vulnerable populations were living. So just looking at occupation ended up having a number of really important ramifications for that health center. Um, 
Another health center that I wanted to, to point out was um, the Healthcare Network of Southwest Florida, uh, which also, they started out looking at um, occupation, but then at the more, they, they, they are migrant health centers, so they have always had uh, sort of a understanding and awareness of migration and mobility among their patient population, but their, their numbers were really decreasing because they'd stopped asking questions about mobility. So they were asking about occupation, but they weren't asking whether or not someone was going to be moving for work. Um, and so they changed, they added a customized field within the registration section of their EHR and their um, and in the practice management section to ask specifically about, um, about mobility. And that then, you know, once, once it was determined that someone was likely to be moving, um, for or migrating for work, then it then it um, put a red flag in their chart, so that there you know there were different um, different resources that could be brought in then to work with that patient um, who was mobile. So again, just another example of um, one adding in one field um, really changing. Um, the way the care was delivered to that patient population. And, you know, just to emphasize again that um, the, that whole notion that you can't, you just can't tackle everything all at once. So a combination of under, doing effective needs assessments so you really understand your patient's needs, but also then at the patient level um, asking whether it's um, gender, gender and sexual identity data, um, or, or other, you know, social determinants of health that you think are going to impact your health, your patient population. Um, this was just, I'll move on, but that, that's a, this is a program that MCN runs, um, this bridge case management for mobile patients. So that's an example of a free resource if a patient has been identified as mobile. Um, and I did want to do a plug since a lot, since this is a rural um, and we are talking about occupation and we're looking at, this is the Ag Worker 2020 campaign that's being run by NAC and um, the National Center for Farm Worker Health. But it really is asking health centers this to identify um, occupation and specifically their farm worker patients to try and bring more, more farm worker patients into care. So just put that out there. Okay, we are two minutes to the hour, and um, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about what we're. So we're going to Jonathan's going to talk about the next session, which is looking at um, capital improvement projects, and then we're going to move into the discussion section. So Jonathan, thanks very much. Uh, great session. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to contribute to the effort. Um, as mentioned, next session will be around the financing, the infrastructure development of rural areas, particularly with social determinants of health in there. And just, you know, participating in some of the earlier sessions as well as today, you know, we've examined what we know, what we want to know, what we need to know, and now we'll move on to what we might be able to afford. Um, so with that in mind, we'll have some specific resources and tools to kind of walk through the feasibility aspect as well as the planning and some of the financing options. Uh, we don't really have any particular homework per se, but there is a debt capacity um, link on our website that I think will provide um, that you can use your own data rather than reference some of the examples that we'll have next week. Um, if you have any questions about where to find that or how to process that, uh, feel free to reach uh, either myself, Jonathan Chapman, or Mark Lurk at Capital Link. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, so at this point, then, um, we want to open up the discussion. And um, Christina and Kristen, uh, I'll let you guys lead us off on that. Sure. Thank you so much, Jillian and Alex and Jonathan. Um, most of you I know have joined us on at least one of these before, so hopefully you remember how it works, but type a comment or question into the question box or raise your hand and we can call on you. I can unmute you if you have entered an audio pin and if you haven't, we'll work with you to figure out how to do that. Um, but I wrote down some 
broad themes as I was listening to Jillian and Alex present. So I just want to throw out there some themes that I thought maybe we could organize our discussion around. And Jillian and Alex, I absolutely invite you both to lead this conversation in whatever direction you want it to go. But I'll, I'll kick things off by putting out what I think are some things we might want to consider um, asking more questions about of Jillian and Alex or asking questions about from each other. So Jillian started out by sharing some information about the PREPARE tool, the, the SDOH screening tool called PREPARE. And I know only, um, what did we say, about 7% of folks said they were currently using PREPARE, but people were in various stages of, of using it. But I thought that one thing that you might want to learn more about or hear from each other about is experiences or tips on using PREPARE or other SDOH screening tools. Um, we also started talking about, Alex gave us this great case study and detailed information about collecting and using SOGI data. And it, it does show up in the UDS under table three, under um, demographic characteristics. So you all have this expectation to collect information around sexual orientation and gender identity. But as Alex shared, many providers don't ask the questions of their patients because they feel uncomfortable, although very few patients have reported that they would feel uncomfortable. So, so Alex shared information about a tool that they have to support in collecting that data. And it made me think that you all may want to talk about um, specifically collecting and using sexual orientation and gender identity data, or more broadly, collecting and using data to get at other issues, other patient characteristics, other patient social determinants for population health purposes. Um, we talked about occupational health in that last case study that Jillian shared. We talked about transportation needs. You all at the very beginning of this learning collaborative shared information with us about um, the specific issues facing your patient populations. So this is your time to learn more and to share about what we can do with data as we seek to improve the services that we're providing to our rural health center patients. So if there are any questions or comments at this point, please start typing them in or raising your hand and we'll try to kick off the conversation. Okay, I have one. Um, Whitney, thank you. Whitney Allen says that the Kentucky PCA is working with nine of our clinics on the CMS Accountable Health Communities Project. Curious if anyone else is collecting SDOH via the CMS AHC tool. Would love to connect with others collecting the same data and sharing promising practices. That's great. Thank you for that question, Whitney. And I would love if anybody else is using that CMS Accountable Health Communities tool, would you chime in? Or if you're using other tools or have experiences you want to share or ask about, please let us know. I know we had a participant who was working on a similar project in Washington. I don't know that he's with us today, um, but it, I, don't, I don't think he was using the CMS tool. Um, let me see. Whitney, I'm going to see if I can unmute you. And if you're willing, maybe you can speak to a little bit more of that. But I don't see your name on the list. Whitney from Kentucky PCA. Oh, here we go. Whitney, you are unmuted, I think. Do you want to see if you can give us a little more information about what you're doing and how it's working for you and what you'd like to learn more about? Sure, this is Whitney, can you hear me? Yes, sounds great. Great, so we are working with the University of Kentucky, their Center for Health Services Research. They got funded through the CMS Accountable Health Communities Project. So they are the bridge organization and they've partnered with us um, the PCA, and then we are using nine of our um, organizations. So most of them are federally qualified health centers. 
Um, the Kentucky PCA is a little bit different. We also have rural health clinics in our membership as well. So we have a few rural health clinics um, participating in that project as well. We just started in August of this year. Um, so just finished up our first quarter um, end of August, um, or sorry, end of um, October. And so we just kind of have some preliminary data, but already running into a few hurdles. So um, I guess I was just curious to talk to anyone else that was collecting social determinants of health data via their tool. They do use some of the same screening questions that the prepare tool uses as well. Um, so just curious if anyone had any feedback and love to connect offline too as well. Does anyone have thoughts about this? While you're thinking about it, I wanted to ask Whitney if you'd be willing to expand a little on, um, you mentioned you're running into a few hurdles as you're collecting the data, but also that you've got some preliminary data and I was Thinking earlier, I'd love to hear from any of you um, if you are collecting SDOH data with a tool like Prepare or with a tool like this CMS Accountable Health Communities tool, or if you're looking at the sexual orientation and gender identity data that you get into the UDS or your, your um, patient characteristics, like whether you have a lot of individuals experiencing homelessness or migratory and seasonal agricultural workers. Uh, is anyone using this existing data? Um, what's the data telling you and, and are there some ways that you're using it to serve your patient populations? So Whitney, for you specifically, can you share a little bit about what that preliminary data is telling you? Are you learning some things that that are new and surprising? Or are you confirming things you already felt you knew? What are, what are you learning so far? So through this data, we've realized transportation is a huge issue, which wasn't a surprise. It's um, kind of something we already knew that was gonna be an issue, especially in Southeastern Kentucky. Um, some barriers we're running into is navigation follow-up. Um, so for the CMS project, the patient receives the screening, and if they are identified as high risk, meaning that they have some type of health-related social need identified, and they have went to the emergency room two or more times in the last 12 months, then they're identified as high risk, and they get moved into navigation, um, which is one-on-one -on -one encounter with um, a navigator at the clinic to provide them some one-on-one -on -one support and linkages to community resources. So unfortunately, sometimes that those people are kind of dropping off for whatever reason that they are not accepting the, the navigation or you know, the navigator has a huge caseload and they're not able to follow up with them as much as they would like. So if anyone else has you know ideas for promising practices for follow-up you know, from the clinic, um, this is, as you know, you know, one additional project that we're asking these clinics to do on top of everything else. And so, unfortunately, sometimes that falls by the wayside, but we realize how important it is. And we've already collected a lot of really good stories about how this screening has led to one-on-one -on -one conversations with providers and that, you know, just identifying one social need has led to the navigator being able to find this person housing and then they got a job and so it just totally turned their life around just by the clinic asking these questions so have some really good success stories but also still struggling a little bit as well that is that is very inspiring and it also sounds challenging um what what other success stories are out there what have you all what have any of you been able to do as a result of learning more about the social determinants needs of your patients? I know very few people are using the prepare tool specifically, but um, as Jillian mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the fields in prepare already exist in the UDS. So you already have lots of SDOH data. Give, give, give us some ideas. What, what's something that you've done that you're proud of? that your health center or your organization has done that you're proud of to address SDOH needs? Is 
I'm getting input at this point. Um, while we wait, Jillian or Alex, is there anything that you would like to expand on? Um, Alex, I thought it was great how you gave the really detailed, oh, we have a comment, how you gave the really detailed um, overview of, of how health centers can use SOGI data. So I want to start brainstorming about how we can use data like that to help other populations. And um, we have one person with a comment, so let me give Shelly Harden a chance to comment. Shelly, I'm going to mute you. Okay, you should be unmuted. Why don't you give it a shot? Shelly, can you, can you try talking? I'm not hearing Shelly. You might be muted yourself. We have a comment from Megan Cunningham, and I'll come back to you, Shelly, if you can try to um, get yourself totally unmuted. But Megan says, we've just begun using the PREPARE model, but we're encouraged by the early results of the information collected by our new community health worker program, because patients are more comfortable talking with someone who is from their culture and speaks their language. Um, I think that's a really yeah that's a, that's a great point mm -hmm. um, and, and speaks to that um, you know the ability of different health centers to really utilize the the resources that they have and the systems that they've developed and so I think those health centers that have that already have a community health worker program or a good outreach program are are going to be really ahead of the game absolutely it's done um, yeah, absolutely. Megan, I'd love to hear more from you about that in a second. And I think Shelly managed to unmute herself. So Shelly, tell us what you were thinking about too. Oh, we still can't hear you. Shelly? All right, sorry folks, technical difficulties. Um, Megan, would you, Shelly, is that you trying to pop in? Okay, Megan, do you have anything that you'd like to say more about your community health worker program? What kinds of um, what kinds of things, if you're willing to share, are your patients more comfortable sharing with a community health worker than they might be with a provider in an office setting? Am I unmuted? Yep, you are. Okay. Um, well, it, like I said, it's just uh, a very initial um, results that are coming in for a program that we're actually working with APCHO. We're a sub uh, grantee with APCHO for a larger CDC diabetes prevention program. Um, and so we haven't had community health workers before, so this is our first foray into having this type of program. And we're really excited by um, how uh, the, the community health workers are able to go out into the community and get information um, from patients and sometimes not even patients of ours <laughs> um, and getting personal information such as, um, you know, their weight and their diet. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, uh, I still uh, don't know all of the results that have come in. We're, you know, it's, it's so new. Um, but it's a lot more information than we'd had before, and people are a lot more open to this. We have community health workers that speak the um, five different languages that are um, prominent in Maui, and um, they are, uh, it, it just seems obvious that they're having a lot more um, uh, success than when we do warm handoffs in the clinic for example. That's great, that's great. And it, it, I'm, I'm glad for you that you're having this um, success with your foray into using community health workers. As Jillian said, that often turns out to be a really powerful supportive strategy for, for a lot of different patients. But this is also really important that we're learning how to collect data, data on social determinants of health because 
this is exactly when we need to make sure that it's being done correctly. <laughs> absolutely. Um, absolutely. We have, I want to invite anyone to comment on that or ask additional questions about that. In the meantime, I have a comment from Olivia at the Montana Primary Care Association. And Olivia says, as a PCA, we're assessing the UDS data and identifying disparities in the current data. And then we're looking at integrating support for specific UDS measures in our UDS support work. For example, how can we better train and support Montana Community Health Centers in SOGI data collection and the number of people experiencing homelessness or living in public housing? So Olivia, you should be unmuted. Can you? Um... Can you hear me, Kristen? Yes. Great. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we. I think that uh, we were really excited about Prepare. Um, I think Prepare is super exciting, um, but we're in a place where we couldn't kind of jump into that level of data collection and support as a PCA, and so we're really kind of stepping back to to look at what health centers are already collecting and reporting on in their UDS. And when we did an assessment, it was very clear kind of where we are completely, I think, missing the mark in our UDS data and where we're doing a, a, a kind of a good or a reasonable job. And so starting with UDS measures, because it's what health centers must report on. Um, and I think what's been challenging about that is that, you know, we provide um, and a lot of folks provide UDS training, right? But I think that most of that training isn't on social determinants or demographic data. Um, and this, the level of support isn't on those specific things. And so how do we provide better guidance, better definitions and better support to our health centers here in Montana so that, so that we, we start with what they absolutely have to report and ensure that that is good quality data before we um, before we kind of invest further and prepare or other measures. And so I would say we're trying to do that work. I still think that there's a ton. I still think that um, we would love to hear of some organization that was doing some kind of national work specifically on supporting that um, because I think it's a, we're kind of putting pieces together, but it would be um, welcome support from any of the national Do you, groups. Do you um, do you connect already with with high tech h i t e q no. they no. are a national cooperative agreement um and they're um really they're they're funded to do to look at data um and they're really intimately familiar with with uds um and i have found them to be extremely responsive um maybe kristen we can send um Either Jillian Mancini or Sue's this number out um, sure. because I think that they might be really helpful for you. Um, I mean, it sounds like you're trying to help the health centers in your state do a better job of analyzing the data that they have. Is that an accurate? I would say anal. I, I would say analyzing the data they have, but but. Um, do, doing better data collection with the measures they're currently collecting. Yeah. Okay. So high tech is going to be is they're going to probably be more effective on the on the analysis side. Mm -hmm. But um, which which you know I think is one thing that could be really helpful. And then the data collection, of course, yeah, that's another another issue. I love, though, Olivia, that you're, I, I think this is really important because we have so few people who have yet started venturing into prepare. And I love that you are focusing on what everybody already currently is collecting. I think it's important that we realize, and I think Alex's presentation really sort of brought this into high relief for me. There's a lot of data that we already have access to, but part of the challenge is how do we make sure we're getting accurate data? Are we asking the right questions to get the right answers and doing it in a way that we can have people trust us enough to tell us the truth? Um, and then what do we do with it once we have it? So I, I think it's great that the Montana PCA is starting with, even as you're venturing into prepare, that you're using the data that already exists in the UDS. And I appreciate that um, suggestion, if I interpreted your comment correctly, to maybe 
incorporate um, addressing needs that are identified through the data in UDS trainings? Do you think that's kind of a fair? I think that's a, I, I absolutely. Cause I think that there's a, the UDS training um, is very specific, but it doesn't, for example, if we're talking about rural homelessness, right? Making sure that we are really asking the right questions to get to get an accurate number of patients who are experiencing homelessness, because often rural homelessness looks very different. And if somebody isn't, if they're not a uh, healthcare for the homeless grantee and required to report on the specifics of the kind of homelessness mm -hmm. that they're experiencing, right? Like th that, the some of that can get lost. And so I think, I think that there's an, op I think that we would welcome an opportunity um, to kind of, to participate, to have somebody else train us on some of the nuances about how we could um, more streamline and dig deeper, ask some different questions to improve some of that data potentially. That's great. That's a great that's I think a great the NPAs point. should give that a lot of thought. <laughs> we've got mm -hmm. we, we've got access to each other and we'll probably pick your brain one day soon, Olivia. Um, I have well, a, I was wondering, I was on uh, that uh, yeah, sort of along those lines, um, Alex, I was wondering, I don't know if you can unmute, but um if uh, the National LGBTQ Education Center, do you guys have any existing trainings? on because you you really raised that point of people ticking off the box but not necessarily asking the question mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if you have any training around soji data collection yeah we do a lot of training in that area it's become very much part of our bread and butter there's a ton of uh, demand and interest and anxiety at health centers about how to do this correctly and also commitment to doing it. So we, we do many SOGI trainings throughout the year. We have um, on our website, lgbthealtheducation.org, various live webinars that are archived specifically about the nuts and bolts of how you not just collect the staff in terms of, uh, collect the data in terms of staff training and, and best practices on that front, but how IT and uh, quality improvement initiatives can be powered by these data, how they can be used for clinical decision support to enhance outcomes. We also have a PCORI grant that just started this year, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Grant, where we're training health centers around the country. We're randomizing them to one of two conditions, either on-site training and technical assistance focused on practice transformation with SOGI data collection and how you use it to do population health management and you know, try to improve outcomes versus just watching a one hour webinar at other health centers. And we're going to track these health centers over a couple of years. We developed a composite measure of health outcomes for LGBTQ patients based on the UDS, looking at cancer screening, sexual health, mental health, primary care, measures like diabetes. And we're going to see if the training and technical assistance we do demonstrably impacts real health outcomes for the population. And the mix of health centers we're looking at is um, totally you know, across the board. Uh, two weeks ago, we were at Winding Waters Health Center in rural Oregon on the Idaho border uh, in Joseph, Oregon, in a county of 7,000 people. And they're doing the most amazing SOGI data collection uh, initiative you've, you've ever seen. So um, yeah, we're definitely here. We're funded like all MCAs to provide technical assistance at no cost to health centers. So feel free to be in touch. That's great. Thank you, Alex. Um, Megan Cunningham had a question wondering if there are other examples or case studies of rural health centers using SDOH data effectively that's allowed them to advocate um, or influence policymakers. So I wonder if any of you have comments about that. And Megan, you're unmuted if you, uh, if you want to give any more context to that question. But has anyone been able to use SDOH data, whether through a specific screening tool like Prepare or through the UDS data that you already collect or some other mechanism that you've been able to use that data to influence policymakers? And if so, would you like to mention it? Hi, this is Alex. Just to um, quickly provide an anecdote there, and I take no credit for this because it was before my time at Fenway, but 
Fenway Health, our health center in Boston, was collecting SOGI data for the last 15, 16 years and used the data we collected to lobby the Bureau of Primary Health Care for about a decade until our health center convinced them to incorporate it into the UDS and have it be um, you know, something required for all health centers because it's so important and we use data from the Institute of Medicine and Health People 2020 to um, further substantiate that. So you can really make a difference if there's something that's unique to the population you serve. Um, you know, don't underestimate your ability to influence policy in that regard. That's great. Thank you, Alex. We've only got about there's, four there's, I, was, I was just going to say there's also been um, instances in which, so going back to my example of, um, of occupation and looking at farm work in particular, um, there have been instances of um, when people understand uh, occupation and then the exposures that people, the patients may have, um, being able to influence um, pesticide policy, for instance, uh, and where, in, you know, and in those cases, clinicians can be incredibly powerful advocates to, um, to do things, you know, there's, there's things like, it doesn't have to be necessarily even um, advocating for the elimination of a certain pesticide, although that has been done, but also things like, um, you know, are pesticide labels in, written in the language that, um, that the patient population will, you know, will, can understand, that sort of thing. So that, there has been some effective um, advocacy in, in that area around pesticide exposure in particular. And health centers have been really central to that. That's great, Jillian. And yeah, I, I think also your um, observation that clinicians specifically have been able to be really strong advocates is an important one. You want to make sure that your messenger is the most powerful person you can find to, um, to influence hearts and minds. Um, so we are at 28 minutes past the hour. We probably don't have time to start up a new conversation, but we are so delighted to have had you all join us and we hope you'll be back again for our fourth and final session of this particular learning collaborative next week at the same time when our colleagues from Capital Link will talk about financing infrastructure in, in rural areas. I think that'll be fantastic and a good way to end this. So we will put the slides and resources in the Dropbox folder that you all have access to. Please email us if you have any questions and thank you again and we'll see you in a week. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you.